just as with the human body of Jesus, the human nature of Jesus, God had to just chose to, he didn't have to, he chose to rely on the Blessed Virgin Mary and his humility and her yes, her fiat of the Annunciation, to take on flesh, to take on humanity, to build up the physical human body of Jesus. So too has God chosen that when it comes to the mystical body, what Augustine calls the totus Christus, the whole Christ, God chooses again to rely on Mary and her humanity. Greetings, this is Dr. Shane Owens with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. A blessed solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary to each of you. It's a great joy on this solemnity to reflect on this mystery of our faith. This is, as we are familiar if we pray the rosary, the fourth mystery of the rosary. And I think just briefly I want to reflect on the fact that when we speak about it being a mystery, we should then think of this in a category of mysteries like the mystery of the Trinity or the mystery of the Incarnation mystery of the resurrection and salvation of the human person. What that means when we speak about a mystery in this way is that we and our human intellects will not come to a kind of comprehensive grasp. We won't understand the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the same way that we understand 2 plus 2 equals 4. I can grasp that completely. My children are beginning to grasp that in a kind of completeness. I think the other thing that is interesting when we look at this idea that the assumption is a mystery is the idea that we need the church's tradition to understand it. The Bible alone is not enough or sufficient for understanding the assumption. I recently spoke at the Defending the Faith conference at Franciscan University just across the street from the St. Paul Center here. And afterwards I had about an hour conversation with a young man who's studying and praying and thinking about becoming a Catholic, himself as a Protestant. And it was interesting to me, I think it's the first ever time I had this in this conversation with him, that his one hang-up in all of this was the bodily assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It didn't have to do with Marian intercession necessarily, or he even willingly admitted that he thought the queenship of Mary made sense. So that fifth and final mystery of the mysteries of the rosary, the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that was not the problem. It was the bodily assumption. And one of his arguments he had is he said he didn't see sufficient biblical evidence for this dogma of the Catholic faith declared by Pope Pius XII in 1950. Now, I do want to argue for the biblical basis, because this is the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, but I also think it's worth noting that the Bible alone is rarely sufficient for the articulation of doctrine. For instance, the word Trinity never appears in Scripture, and if ancient church history is any clue, and I frequently teach ancient church history, the Bible was not sufficient for articulating the divinity of Christ, the two natures of Christ united in one person, three persons united in one Godhead, and the Most Holy Trinity. None of those were agreed on unanimously. If the Bible was transparent or clear in those rather than obscure, we would have not had so many ancient heresies. All the conflict the church had, the necessity of those early ecumenical councils in the life of the church. So too with the assumption that there is scriptural evidence, but it also requires the church's uh, guidance by the Holy Spirit and her discernment and studying and praying and contemplating those scriptures, her own worship that will take us to the beliefs we have. The other kind of uh, introductory remark to make here is a principle that is actually quite important for many teachings of the church, but particularly important when we think about the assumption, which is this pr principle in Latin known as lex orandi, lex credendi. That is, the law of prayer is the law of belief. Then when the church wants to know what she believes, we often look at what we do. For instance, the idea of purgatory or prayer for the dead. From the earliest centuries of the church, Christians have prayed for the deceased. This means that there must be some state in which Christians benefit from the prayers of those who are still on earth. For those in hell do not need prayers, they can't get any better off, and those in heaven don't need prayers either, they're already in a situation as good as it gets. So it's only those who are undergoing purification and what we call purgatory as Catholics that would benefit from the prayers for the dead. The assumption is a similar kind of teaching of the Christian faith, that the assumption is something that Christians for over a millennia have prayed about, that they've reflected on, they've meditated on. It's been commemorated on August 15th today for so many centuries. In the, in the medieval church, it was one of the highest feasts, probably third or fourth only after Easter, Christmas, and perhaps Pentecost as far as commemorations of the ancient church of such tremendous importance. So now we've had these opening remarks. I really want to look at the assumption under two lenses. The first of those two lenses will be under this lens of Mary as the new ark. And the second is Mary as mother of the church. So first, Mary as the new ark. We can see this first and foremost in Luke chapter 1, where there are all these images, and we could spend a whole video really just on Luke 1 and the various ways that it shows Mary as a new ark. 
We have the Holy Spirit overshadowing her at the Annunciation. You have John the Baptist leaping at the presence of Jesus in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, like David leaping before the ark. You have the ark remaining for three months in the hill country of Judah, just as Mary, the new ark with Jesus in her womb, remains for three months with Elizabeth to care for her in her final trimester of pregnancy with St. John the Baptist, this miraculous child of the promise that Elizabeth and Zechariah received. Again and again, we see these connections that show Mary to be a new ark. The ark held the Ten Commandments. The ark held the manna. The ark held the staff of Aaron. And in Mary, we see the definitive high priest, the divine high priest of Jesus. We see the bread of life. We see he who becomes the definitive lawgiver, who sends the new law of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Mary's a new ark. But maybe the best text or the most important text, is to take that image of the new ark that we've already established from Luke 1, and we need to place that new ark in heaven. And we see that in the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of John, which is a mystical and very difficult text. But if we look at the closing verses of Revelation 11 and the opening verses of Revelation 12, they're helpful for understanding the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth and anguish for delivery. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems upon his heads. Now, a few things to note about this text we just read. One is, when we read it in our modern Bibles, whether that's in English or French or German, we're used to seeing chapter divisions, and they have these various headings and subheadings. And the text I read is actually interrupted by a little subheading, at least in my RSV Bible, that says the woman and the dragon, that splits these into two parts. But sometimes these chapter headings can be misleading, that the chapters are not actually added until the 1200s by a gentleman known as Stephen Langton, who was the Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury in England, and he added those chapter divisions. It's another almost 300 years before we see verses added to the Bible. It makes it a lot easier to refer to. But what this means is sometimes these chapter or verse divisions split up a material that is actually united at a literary level, that the words or the organization of the text would suggest something otherwise. And I would argue this is one of those cases, that actually Revelation, the end of Revelation 11, and the beginning of Revelation 12 are meant to flow into one another. And we can see this, that that actually what we have is that when the ark is seen in the temple, we then get this repetition of a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. It is precisely this woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant we met in Luke chapter 1. And there's a few other details that can help us connect these. First, we hear in the first portion, which is assigned to Revelation 11, that this Ark that is seen in the heavenly temple, this new and definitive Ark, different from the Ark that was lost, the Ark that Indiana Jones looks for, right? This is a new heavenly Ark. We hear that when it's present in the temple, that there are loud noises. There are voices that are crying out. And then what do we hear about at the beginning of Revelation 12? We hear about this woman doing what? Crying out in anguish for delivery and her birth pangs. There we have the very loud noises that are spoken back about in the first portion. This also connects us to a really fascinating prophecy in Isaiah 66. Listen, an uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she was delivered of a son. A striking text here in Isaiah 66 that is reminiscent of Revelation 11 and 12. Another point that connects the Ark of the Covenant and the first portion to the woman and the second portion is the repetition of the word appeared. In the English translations that I consulted, for whatever reason, these words are actually translated differently in English, despite the fact that the Greek word, the Koine Greek word behind them is the same. So, for instance, in the text of the RSV, it says the Ark of his Covenant was seen, and it says a great sign appeared. But actually, the Greek word is identical in both cases. It's appeared and appeared. The Greek word um, horao. And so you actually have these connected, that the Ark of the Covenant appears, the woman appears. I think that's intended to be a direct connection. Also, if we pay attention to what John the Seer, the author of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, does, he often presents multiple symbols for the same person. So shortly later in Revelation 12, he will describe the enemy of God as a serpent, a dragon, devil, Satan, and deceiver. So he actually uses five images for the same person later in Revelation 12. Earlier, one of my favorite examples of this that are used with my students in class is in Revelation chapter 5. You get this interesting image, and this is speaking of Jesus. Then one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, 
so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes. Now what's striking about this, this is just like Revelation 11 and 12, but it's not split by two chapters, so we connect them more naturally, is that when this elder is speaking to John the seer, he says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we would think that perhaps what we're about to see is a lion. But what do we actually see when we read just a verse later in Revelation 5? I don't see a lion. No, what I see is a lamb standing as though slain. This is a perfect parallel for what is happening with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Behold, the heavenly ark has appeared in the heavenly temple. And that ark is a woman clothed to the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So that is Mary as the new ark. And she's there bodily. She is present bodily in, in this heavenly vision, seen in this heavenly temple by John the seer, a suggestion of her bodily assumption. Second here, the second image after the new ark that I wanted to look at is Mary as mother of the church. This is connected to another dogma of the Catholic faith, in this case declared in the year 431 at the Council of Ephesus, championed by St. Cyril of Alexandria, one of the church fathers. The notion here is that Mary is Theotokos in Greek, that is, mother of God, or God-bearer, translated more literally. What St. Cyril argues is that mothers are mothers of persons and not natures. Let's just look at any human baby as an example, perhaps, of this. We can think of my own children, given my wife gave birth to them. Now, in the case of the conception of those children, there is a kind of uh, mutual act of human and divine creation. This is what makes it procreation for human beings and not just the reproduction of the animals outside. The body is created by the combination of two gametes, right? And then now you have a zygote that grows into a human. But at the moment of conception, with an explosion of light, scientists tell us, we know that God also infuses and creates from nothing, not using any of the genetic material from the parents, he creates from nothing, an immaterial spiritual soul that'll animate that body that is immortal, that will exist forever. Now, in that case, what we see is that even though the husband and wife only contribute the genetic matter for the body, and when birth actually happens, no matter how complicated or long it is, whether it's by cesarean or natural, in your home or in a hospital, when that birth happens, the woman is giving birth to the body of the baby. A soul isn't big. It's not the soul that has to squeeze through the birth canal or make its way around the hips, right? The soul doesn't take up any space. It's immaterial. It's only the body. But it would not seem appropriate or fitting for me to then say to my wife, well, congratulations for giving birth to a body. No, we talk about her giving birth to a person. The whole of the person is born. So too with Mary. In the case of Jesus, we don't have a person who's created from nothing. He's the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, the Son, who has always existed. But this divine person takes on a new nature, a human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. When she gives birth, there's all kinds of theories and ideas and spiritual traditions about how that birth went traditionally without pain as though light passing through glass. We're not going to talk about that all in this case. But when Mary gave birth, she gave birth just like my wife Esther to a body. It's a body that passed out of her in whatever way it passed out of her. The soul of Jesus, he has a human soul, doesn't take up space, doesn't have to come through the birth canal, nor did the divinity take up space. God is immaterial. It didn't have to pass through the birth canal. But we speak of Mary because persons are born, not natures. It's not just Jesus' human nature, not just humans, Jesus' human body that's born. It's his entire humanity that's born. We speak of Mary as the mother of God, and rightly so, the church teaches us. And so Mary raises Jesus in his physical humanity. But his physical humanity, crucified, buried in the tomb, has now been resurrected. It has been glorified and now has ascended in its seats at the right hand of God in glory. It doesn't need to grow or mature anymore. It has reached the perfection that it was destined for. But there's another body that Christ has taken to himself that continues to grow and mature. And that's the mystical body of the church. That mystical body of the church continues to grow. In the language of St. Paul, it's a letter to the Colossians. The head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. With Christ as our head, the whole body is nourished and knit together. It's a beautiful image, and God gives it growth. This is the growth of the mystical body. But just as with the human body of Jesus, the human nature of Jesus, God had to just chose to, he didn't have to, he chose to rely on the Blessed Virgin Mary and his humility and her, yes, her fiat, the Annunciation, to take on flesh, to take on humanity, to build up the physical human body of Jesus. So too has God chosen that when it comes to the mystical body, what Augustine calls the totus Christus, the whole Christ, God chooses again to rely on Mary and her humanity. 
Fulton Sheen argues that perhaps it would have been fitting that Mary should have just been assumed on Ascension Thursday. Her mission was complete. She had consented to Jesus at the Annunciation. She'd given birth to him in Bethlehem as the prophecies foretold. She'd escaped to Egypt with him. She'd presented him in a temple. She'd raised him in wisdom, found him in the temple at 12, stood by the foot of the cross. What more could she need to do? Well, if all we're speaking of is the physical, personal body of Jesus and his humanity, there didn't seem to be any more work to be done. But as the Acts of the Apostles tells us in Acts 1.14, all these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Mary was intimately familiar with the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. It had happened at the Annunciation when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her as the new ark and Jesus came to dwell in her womb. Well, now Mary, spouse of the Spirit, as St. Francis first called her, the spouse of the Spirit waits with the apostles and disciples to call upon the Holy Spirit again to overshadow not just her, but the whole of the mystical body of Christ. And in a very beautiful way, we can think of Mary staying to raise the church, to help the church flourish and grow to maturity in the same way she did for Jesus and his humanity. It's even been said that she had to nurse the mystical body, of course, in a spiritual sense, here to bring the church to maturity. But in the same way, when Jesus turned 30, he left Mary's presence and went out to her into public ministry and was away from her. We can imagine that there was a time where the mystical body reached its maturity. Now, we still seem to be maturing and growing. There's plenty of ways the church could mature more. But the time for Mary to nurse the church was no longer there, and it became time for our Lord Jesus to assume Mary, body and soul, into heaven, what we commemorate today on this solemnity that Pentecost was Mary's spiritual Bethlehem, and she has completed that. Maybe just a few final remarks. First is a story, and then last, a meditation from the Second Vatican Council. First is a story. It's been told in many different ways. I've heard it illustrated differently and extrapolated differently, but I'll try to tell it in the simplest form so I don't bring in anything that has been kind of grown in the story as part of the telephone game as the story has been told again and again. It's a story about Dorothy Day, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, a very holy and special woman. But the story is told by a man who was with her and worked closely with her in the Catholic Worker Movement that a priest came to say Mass at the Catholic Worker House in New York City. And when he said Mass, he used a ceramic coffee mug and a, uh, a plate, like a coffee saucer plate, as the patent for Mass. Now, Dorothy Day wasn't critical of him. She didn't chastise him or anything kind of publicly. But what she did do at the end of Mass is that she took that mug, she took that plate, and she buried them in the garden of this little poor home, Catholic worker home in New York City. Because as Dorothy Day later said when she was questioned by someone who saw her burying it, that coffee mug now touched by the precious blood of Jesus, that plate now touched by particles of the precious body of Jesus, were no longer fit for coffee and crumpets that they now had a kind of holy and perfected dignity. So too could we apply this to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary, whose body as the new Ark of the Covenant had held within her the divine person, Jesus Christ, and his divinity and his humanity, had now been given a special dignity. Now the church has not told us in the assumption whether Mary died, whether she fell asleep, whether she was buried. Her body and soul were taken up. It leaves great freedom. There's a kind of playground with a fence around it. You can go all the way to the fence about how you understand it to happen. You can imagine all the different paintings or icons that show this differently. But we know is that Jesus took this body, this body of his blessed mother, in whom he developed, from whom he nursed, whom you can imagine he embraced frequently, and he took that body up into heaven. The final thing I'll note here is something from the Second Vatican Council. After the Second Vatican Council, for us, much of the controversy we think about, about the Second Vatican Council has to do with the Mass and putting the Mass into English or maybe the ad orientum versus, versus populum. What way is the priest facing? The reforms of the Mass, right? So much of it's liturgical. Um, we can think of other debates about religious liberty or how we uh, speak about other religions or how we speak about our separated brethren, uh, Protestants. But actually, the most controversial question at the entire Second Vatican Council, to the surprise of many, was actually a controversial question about Mary. Not about any particular doctrine or teaching about Mary, but a simple question. Should Mary get her own document, separate from all the other documents of the Council? It was the closest vote by far. 1,114 votes on one side and 1,074 votes on the other, right? Hardly any votes separating these two positions. Ultimately, the winning position was that Mary shouldn't have her own document, but should be included in the document about the church. This was not intended as a dismissal of Mary or a relegation of her to something separate, but instead was trying to point us to something that I think in particular when we talk about the assumption is incredibly important. Lumen Gentium, which means light of the nations, is the church's Vatican II's document on the church, ends with two chapters. Chapter 7 
is on the eschatological nature of the church, meaning that the pilgrim church here is destined for heavenly glory and is united with a heavenly church of angels and saints. And then the eighth chapter is a chapter on the Blessed Virgin Mary. And those chapters are meant to be seen as connected because it's Mary, assumed body and soul into heaven, who sh stands in heaven, who shines in heaven as the one clothed the sun with the moon under her feet and the stars as a crown on her head. It's Mary who shines as an icon and representation of what we can hope for and what the creed describes as the resurrection of the dead or the resurrection of the body that she already enjoys what the whole church is destined for. As the Second Vatican Council teaches, in the interim, just as the mother of Jesus glorified in body and soul in heaven is the image and beginning of the church as it is to be perfected in the world to come, so too does she shine forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come as a sign of sure hope and solace to the people of God during its sojourn on earth. We can think of the Hail Holy Queen, the Salve Regina, that when we are in exile here on earth, we, the children of Eve, we can look to the light of the Blessed Virgin Mary, glorified body and soul to heaven as a solace in our tears. Our first Pope in his first encyclical, 1 Peter chapter 3, tells us, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Pope Peter, St. Peter asks us to be able to defend the reason we have hope. Well, perhaps on this day, the solemnity of the Assumption, what we can point people to as a sign of our hope is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the new ark, the mother of the church, she who is clothed with the sun and who prays for us, intercedes for us, that as we pass through this valley of tears, we may come and join her and be glorified with her and her son for all eternity. This has been Dr. Shane Owens with the St. Paul Center. May you have a blessed Assumption.